So I'll go ahead with my second talk, uh, which is going to be on the, my telemedicine uh, experience at Arabin, where we have the concept of vision centers uh, throughout uh, Tamil Nadu. So I'll just give you a brief history of Aravin. It was started with 11 beds in 1976. And today we have seven tertiary care centers, each seeing around 1,000 to 2,000 patients every day. We have seven secondary care centers, which see around 150 to 400 outpatients per day. We have six community clinics, which sees 100 to 150, each one of them, which sees 100 to 150 outpatients per day. And this, the 97 thing is what I'm going to describe to you as the vision centers or the primary care centers uh, where our experience has been very good. So where we see 20 to 30 outpatients per day. So on a given day at Aravin, there are around 13,000 patient examinations, uh, close to around 2,000 surgeries, five to six outreach camps every day, with 1,500 patients examined at the hospital, and also classes for around 100 residents and uh, technicians and administrators. This is the way we work. So in 2020 and 21, this was our COVID year. So we, we, we are not able to do our fullest activity. Uh, we said we, we could see around close to 3 million outpatient visits, which was just 62% of the previous year. Uh, we did close to 327,000 surgeries. And uh, 38% are free or steeply subsidized. So the topic of my presentation today is to see how we are able to achieve these numbers and whether it is possible to replicate this model uh, throughout the world. And that is why we are uh, looking at it. So this is the breakup, uh, but if you just see the uh, fourth thing is the vision center. Through this model, we were able to see close to around 500,000 patients uh, uh, each year. And that is where uh, our special interest is going to be. So how are we able to get these patients? You might believe, you might think, oh, there are not many uh, ophthalmologists. Believe me, we have more competition than you have. Our cataract surgical rate at Madurai is close to 11,000, which is close to San Francisco, much higher than here. So we have plenty of competition. And if you are not able to do it right, there are some people who can easily take the market uh, from us. So we are not actually looking at our customers. All our policies were actually designed for non-customers. And I'll just show you one example of an outreach camp, uh, which we routinely do. Uh, like what we are going to show you, we, we, we do close to around 20 camps each week. Uh, It's usually held in a school building, very informal, registration. And this is pre-COVID. Vision testing in a school building. Preliminary examination. So we take we go like a circus team and we create a refraction tents there. We we just use it uh, a refraction cubicle from which and then we do a final examination and prescribe medications. And if the patients require spectacles, it is being done at the campsite itself. And if patients require surgery, they are counseled and then transported to the base hospital for surgery. Surgeries done at the base hospital. And then the patients bust back home. So this is the thing which we do like 25 times a week. Uh, week, uh, week on week, this is what we do. We thought we were very happy with this. In fact, in 2020-21, we had 442 camps like this. As I said, since it was a COVID year, uh, our numbers were uh, pretty less. Uh, but we could do around 14,934 cataract surgeries uh, using this community outreach. 
We also have very special outreach, specific outreach program. We have outreach program dedicated to only diabetic retinopathy screening, where we uh, we see a, uh, a diabetic population alone. We work very closely with the government uh, diabetic hospital, and we do a workplace. I mean, going going to the workplace where they are working in a mill or working in a uh, industry, and then go and do refraction and provide them with spectacles and school children and all these things which we used to do. But what we found out was doing all this was making us feel good. But very interestingly, when we did a study, we found out that only 7% of the patients who required eye care was being done or was being reached through this uh, service care delivery model. Why? Because we are going at our convenience. We don't care whether the patients are in town or not. Uh, and if the patients have missed that, they usually wait for a, for one whole year before they come. So there was not a constant uh, service delivery system. And so what we found out was why is there only 7% of the people who are accessing care? What we realized was services needed to be continuously available because the camps are just a, a makeshift model where we go at our convenience, but we also needed something which could be scalable over a period of time. And so we came with an idea of a vision center. This was way back in 2004. This was actually a project of University of Berkeley. A students from University of Berkeley came over, and at that point of time, there was no broadband. There's no broadband at all. But then uh, at Aravin, we'd like to explore things, even when, when things are uh, looking. I, I always, I, I, I joke with Brent, if our founders had thought logically, Aravind would never have come up. Uh, they, they, they never thought logically. Uh, you, you need to have a crazy, some sort of a craziness in your uh, element of thought to make something uh, different. So in the year 2004, they came with a low cost Wi-Fi model uh, with the unidirectional antenna and we could set up so-called vision centers. And I'll describe to you how our vision centers uh, actually work. But the problem with this model was it had to be only at the line of sight. That is, you need to have an antenna and anything which is just, as long as things are not obstructing, uh, you would get the vision center functioning. But today, we have broadband technology. And as I said, we have like 100 locations. Uh, when, when I started making the slide like six months before, it was 93. Now we have 100 locations in which uh, these vision centers are functioning. And we also have uh, dual connectivity with two providers because in case if we are not able to get one provider right, we, we have the second thing. Where do we actually keep these vision centers? We are very, very clear that we will not go to a place where doctors are available. When doctors are available, we don't need to be there. We go there where doctors will not go because it's really in the periphery. But there has to be a reasonable amount of population, at least 50,000 population. And when there's a congregation of villages uh, which are there, but the technology availability and the HR availability is the key. So this is how a typical uh, vision center looks like, a very ordinary looking place because it is not very sophisticated. You're just going to have 20 or 25 footfalls per day from morning to evening, so you can't afford to have a fancy uh, setup. And how are the model? The model is actually a comprehensive care, and I'll show you what we mean by comprehensive care at the vision center. But more importantly, it works six days a week. Unlike the camps, which just hold, goes there one day a year, this is a permanent setup where patients will pay for uh, their services, but they'll pay like a fraction, like 20 rupees. That is like uh, 30 cents for a comprehensive checkup, and that is valid for three checkups. And so we also have uh, a robust monitoring system, uh, which will help us to know whether we are providing the best of the care. And I'll show you how we uh, do all these things. So it functions on all days. When I say all days, we don't work on Sundays. It's also staffed by certified uh, allied ophthalmic personnel. We are very, very, uh, we are very careful because there, there is nobody to supervise them. So they need to be well-trained, much more well-trained than the staff at the base hospital. So usually we ask them to work at the base hospital for a period of six or seven years. The way it works at Aravind is they usually join as an MLOP when they are 18. And usually they get married by 24. It's like a 90% uh, female uh, workforce. 
uh, before you wonder, amongst the doctors, it is 93% female workforce. So it's not uh, confined only to uh, uh, medical. My mother is fond of saying Aravind is successful only because of that, uh, having a predominantly uh, a female workforce. But we have people who are well-trained, who have been at Aravind for at least five years manning this uh, vision centers. Usually what is beneficial for them is when they get married, the custom is to move to the husband's house. And uh, usually if that is not in Madurai, they just quit work. But the advantage for them is when we have so many of these in the rural pockets, and if it's closer to uh, their, uh, their house, they can come and uh, join the services uh, from their house. So it's, it's a win-win situation for everybody. So what we actually do is, there is an initial registration. It's just man, each vision center is manned by two people. One is a, 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 a VC coordinator who is in charge of registration. And then there's a refraction technician who can do fantastic refraction because they've already worked at Aravind for at least six or seven years. We don't laterally recruit people at all. But in our culture, in, at, in the uh, Aravind scheme of things, we tend to really value the cultural part more. Uh, so we don't really take in people immediately and then put them in a vision center. We, we, we keep only people who are with us for a period of five to six years. We have a slit lamp in each of the vision centers. An intraocular pressure measurement is being done. A fundus photography is being taken by either a handheld camera or a, a, a topcon fundus scopy. And then by video conferencing, each patient is being uh, uh, sent to a doctor's examination. So one doctor, it just requires very quick things. It's manned by a third year resident. Uh, and I, take it from me, I'm not, I don't want to put the residents down. I was a resident. These girls are much more uh, very well qualified because they've been in the job for 10 years. The only thing is they don't have a medical license. That's it. So usually their, their uh, diagnosis and other things is very good. And then optical dispensing by the VZ coordinator here. Uh, and then the patient gets the glass. So the, the camp was a free camp. Patient did not have to pay anything. Here, the patients have to pay 20 rupees. The patients have to pay for their glasses. They have to pay at least 800 rupees for their glasses. So this is where the sustainability element comes from. Why do they prefer to pay when there's a free camp? A free camp doesn't come every day. And if the patient requires a free glasses, the patient has to go and collect it in the uh, uh, main hospital, or sometimes they have to come back to the main hospital, which costs them much more than the uh, cost which is uh, which they will incur when they pay, buy a pair of spectacles in the vision center. So this is something like a drip irrigation. All money which is destined for ophthalmology goes only to ophthalmology. Because when they come to the base hospital, they need to pay for the bus, they need to pay for the food, they need to pay for so many other things, and they need to pay for the opportunity cost, because here, they order their glasses, they go to their farms, work, and then come in the evening and still get their glasses. So they don't need to lose out on their day of wages. So that is where the sustainability element uh, comes, comes in play here. I'll just show you a video here. This is a typical setup. Over 65% the... of Indians reside in villages. With doctors and healthcare services concentrated in urban cities, how can we ensure that IK reaches these rural folks? Arvan Eye Hospitals in South India have built a network of 100 rural vision centers that provide comprehensive eye care. Each of these rural centers are permanent facilities. Patients are registered into the vision center system. Trained vision technicians then examine the patients using a standard examination protocol. All 
necessary investigations are done a detailed picture of the inside of the eye is also taken all these details are entered into an electronic medical record system madam patient name palani amal madam each patient is seen by an ophthalmologist who sits at one of arun's eye hospitals the doctor at the base hospital can view the electronic medical record of this patient the vision technician then presents the patient and her findings to the doctor the doctor then interacts with the patient and then prescribes the appropriate treatment ungalku enna seiyadhu nu solunga madam paaru vandu sariya theriyala madam neenga eppadi nalla mangala irukku oru rendu moonu maasam aagum if the doctor advises eye drops or spectacles the prescription gets automatically printed at the vision center those requiring glasses can buy a pair of affordable spectacles at the vision center itself if the patient needs to be referred for surgery the counselor at the vision center explains the condition why surgery is necessary and the procedure involved in going to the hospital and getting the surgery done all patients get a full eye examination and a teleconsultation with an ophthalmologist all for rupees 20 that is about 30 cents in this way Arvind's Vision Center network handles over 800,000 patients visits each year thus ensuring sustainable primary eye care within the reach of rural India. So if you really see we're trying to convert a free model into a paying model but the more important thing is the paying model is more preferable for the customer because it is at their convenience and when they say free nothing comes in this world for free to access a free setup they usually have to pay four times more than what they would have if they pay for their services at their doorstep so that's the that's the whole principle behind uh, setting up uh, this vision centers so right now uh, this number would be around 2400 or 2500 Uh, when i made this around 6 uh, uh, months back it's around 2200 consultations per day if you really see telemedicine uh, it's usually like a marquee thing uh, you know very rare uh, you put some very few numbers uh, but we have made we have created a system in which uh, we we are able to see large numbers of, of these patients and uh, it's very easy to have because everything is done for them and it's just like a a uh, mix and match thing and then uh, uh, the patients get their preference uh, at the uh, vision center level so there's also a lot of community involvement if the same group first of all cannot they so many people cannot come to the main vision center and when they come to the vision center uh, when, and to the main hospital and they come to the main hospital they are so disciplined there's no emotional uh, thing you know they have to be so we we sort of convert them into zombies and so they they have to be very very strict with all these things but in the vision center they can be themselves and uh, there is a, a societal involvement which will ensure follow up which will ensure a sort of a bonding between the healthcare service provider and the uh, recipient so we also measure we go out of the way we also do a screening because we also know that they don't have access to getting blood pressure done we don't think that it is not required uh, we just offer that and then we work with the local physician community uh, if the patient requires some sort of an investigation but things become uh, interesting so what happens is if there is a vision center and there are only 15 people are going to come from morning to evening you have a lot of free time and what do we do with that free time so the the sisters actually go to the place of work in that area one of these uh, areas and then start doing their uh, investigations done it is like something like uh, like on demand videos you know you go to them it is at their beck and call you just flip the whole demand process into their convenience for that they are really willing to pay as long as you are able to uh, charge something which is reasonable 
and which is affordable. So you can see that uh, uh, in a self-health group, uh, our people go and create some awareness. Uh, here you can see they are working some agricultural activity here. Our person is uh, talking about the vision center, talking about the model where uh, you can always come back after work and uh, get your eyes tested. The thing is, accessibility seems to be more important than affordability in today's world. That is what we have learned. And as long as we are able to provide something, just like how you order a pizza to your house, if they are able to order something to their house, they are willing to pay that extra amount, even if they are uh, uh, from a very rural background. How do we assure quality? So it looks as if they are in a remote place and they are doing it. As I said, we don't do any lateral entry. We take only people who have done uh, five or six years at Aravin. But we do other checks, including uh, these kind of things. And I'll show you some of the examples. Some of the global ophthalmology fellows who come over to Aravin, we send them to these vision centers uh, to just see for themselves. And uh, actually, one doctor from Tanzania actually had this to uh, comment because they wanted to do this. And before he went, he was thinking that you know quality might not be possible at at, at the village level. And so, I'm Dr. Picard Adubango from CCBRT Tanzania. That is in Dar es Salaam. I'm here to, for pediatric fellowship, and uh, I got an opportunity to visit one vision center last week. It is the name, if I recall well, is uh, Alanganalu Vision Center. I must admit that it, it is uh, about a half one hour from here. I was very impressed by the quality, the standard of treatment uh, they are providing to the patient there. And my expectation was not that because I knew that it was uh, run by MLOPs who, do, who don't have very high training. But then what I saw was very impressive. I found two MLOPs there, very young. They could assess the eye, both uh, sensory assessment of the vision and uh, motor assessment from vision to refraction, uh, squint assessment, binocular vision. They can assess anterior segment, three thumb uh, examination. Uh, it can also do camera, the anterior segment camera. And also they can take a very high resolution of a Fanda's camera. So all that data, they discuss it with the doctor who will be posted through telemedicine. And uh, they receive the instruction how to go about the patient. Some of the patient will be referred to the main hospital in Madurai, which is just one hour away drive. So I was very impressed and uh, I discussed with them um, I think the, comu the community needs such, such setup of vision center because just through that, I think a lot of uh, side threatening problems can be screened and avoided. Only the necessary case can be sent to the main hospital. So that's what I thought about it. So that was his experience. I'll show you the other video where we enforce uh, how we do quality checking on a, re on a regular basis for this uh, mid-level ophthalmic personnel uh, who are in the vision center. We hold uh, training classes and we hold some examinations uh, regularly like this. So they all come for training uh, three times a year. We have OSCE, the objectively structured clinical examination sections, to continuously brush up uh, their knowledge. So they write an exam. So this is almost certified like two times a year. They have to get it recertified. Some pictures are given to them and uh, some uh, quizzes conducted for them. And they are 
actually given a patient to examine and a doctor is there to sort of train them. So a lot of these kind of training activities have to be done in order to standardize the whole scheme of things. So some questions are uh, also asked on history taking as to how you will do all these things. And the person who supervises them are like people who are having 15 years of experience uh, at the mid-level of Thalmic. So real questions are given to them and uh, asked for their this thing and also a feedback is given to them as to what sort of improvement uh, can be given and how do you counsel and a doctor is always there uh, as a part of the mentoring process so unless you have this training component attached to this thing uh, this is not going to uh, succeed uh, very well so as you can see role plays uh, so this thing so this kind of continued uh, teaching helps them to, to know, uh, to keep them fit with what they are able to understand. So apart from this, every vision center, every month is visited by an ophthalmologist uh, and a, an administrator. They take care of the administration part. They also look at all the slit lamps, clean and whether they have checked the slit lamp right, whether their fundus camera is right, they have checked the forceps, Everything is done just like an air, air, aircraft. You have to go there, and this is done uh, month on month. Uh, as you can see here, sometimes uh, very clear uh, things are also put. It may not be diplomatically right. So this is uh, this thing. And then they also look like whether the fr you have to also be careful because all the inventory is going to be at the vision center, and nobody is going to be there to sort of see them on a daily basis. So you need to have your accounting policies right. So you have to really look at all the uh, checks and balances of all the spectacles, frames, to see whether uh, the accounting policies are right. So again, she says, good improvement in glasses. OP can be improved. Overall performance is good. We also do very, very careful measurement. Here, I'm more mostly Oops. It doesn't matter. Can I go to the next slide, please? Sorry. I'll do an escape option and then, yeah, okay, I'll do a cancel here. So every vision center is ranked on different parameters. Uh, like for example, at this point of time, there were 61 vision centers. So this vision centers for, with regard to new outpatients, it was 32. And with regard to cataract uh, screening, it was 11. And with regard to glasses, it was like 42. So everything is being measured uh, so that uh, they can improve uh, further. So if you really see here per day, OP average is around 15 to 16. Some of the vision centers can go up to 20. But more importantly, you have a continued service to the community, which also helps uh, get good financial implications, both for the patient as well as the hospital. So let me talk about the patients. I just published this in 2021 in cornea. How does a vision center really help patients with corneal ulcers? So we took one vision center. Uh, in that vision center in the year 2019, 10,850 people accessed it. Out of them, 11% had corneal problem. 
Out of those group, 84% were treated at the vision center itself, meaning that these people need not come to the base hospital. And only 16% uh, of the patients had to come to the base hospital. And what were these patients being treated at the vision center? They were treated with painful corneal conditions, especially corneal foreign body, uh, epithelial abrasions, and infectious keratitis. So in this vision center, in one year, for one patient, money saved for patient by attending vision center, by not coming to the hospital, the patient saves almost $16. And see, this is like 1,200 rupees the patient saves. The patient has to pay 20 rupees to the vision center. So it's a win-win situation for the patient. So 950 patients were treated at the vision center in that year. So that means we saved $15,200 for that community with corneal ulcers by having that one vision center. And if this vision center was existing for 10 years, close to almost $94,000 were saved for the patient and the community by one vision center in 10 years. So we have at one vision center, now we have 100 vision center, that means we save close to $1.5 million just on patients with corneal ulcer alone uh, for the community. So this is perceived very well by the community because uh, you, you might think that the patient would come to the free hospital. They come to the free hospital because the paying hospitals are prohibitively expensive. But if you create a system wherein they are able to access a care system where they can easily afford to pay, they want to pay. They have a pride to pay. And then we are able to also offer a service uh, uh, which is being perceived as useful. But more importantly, the painful corneal condition can be addressed very quickly thus limiting morbidity. And so we are able to... Uh... Ralph Eagle had a question. Oh, sorry, you had questions? Oh, sorry, sir. Well, who pays for the hospital, though? Who pays for all this? So I'm, I'm going to come with, okay. I'm going to come, uh, with the, the, the catch uh, part of it. So for this system, for this uh, thing, I'll, I'll go a little bit beyond the slide. Actually, Aravind be believes in a funnel type of a model where you sort of an access people to first come into the system. And so even for the outpatients, we charge very less. But then when they come to the surgery, they are given an option again of a paying patient and a free patient. And uh, the way we treat a paying patient and a free patient is very interesting. I was just telling a story. Let me tell you the story. I'm going a little bit digressing. So 15 years back, a person walks into Aravindai Hospital he goes through a series of checks and he's advised a retinal barrage laser. Uh, he has only a credit card. Uh, 15 years back at our hospital, we didn't have that uh, access to uh, collect the credit card. And our nurses tell him that we don't accept credit card. And that absent-minded scientist tells, I don't have any money. Then what do I do? Then the sister tells him, okay, you can go to the free hospital. The patient goes to the free hospital waits for a day, gets the barrage laser done next day, and then goes, uh, goes back to his work. Luckily for us, 15 years from that time, he becomes the president of India. This is a true story of Dr. Abdul Kalam, who became the president of India, who accessed the free hospital and uh, uh, this thing. The story which I'm trying to tell you is Aravind doesn't spend too much time trying to find out who has the capacity to pay or not to pay. You have a system in place like an economy model, like a first class model or a business class model in the plane. You choose your comfort zone and you can have an access to the this part. That is one part of your story. But I'm going to come back to the economics part of it. Alan? Yeah, can I add a couple of comments, Prashna, with your permission? Yes, please. Um, I've, I've been to Arvind 125 times, so I've been there a few times. And I'm very interested in the vision center concept to bring it to the United States. It was at a vision center with Christian Das and, uh, a few years ago. And one of the sisters, uh, Arvind is really built on woman power, was examining this person and said in Tamil, this person has glaucoma. And Christian Das, who's a glaucoma person, said to me, why don't you take a look? And if you ever, this is an undilated pupil that was fairly myotic. And it's the kind of pupil where you're spending like an hour to look through it and get really see. 
finally I was able to get through the pupil in, in an embarrassing way, and the person was totally cuffed. This person who was not an ophthalmologist was able to detect it. On a side of, of quality care, uh, back in 2019, my wife had her cataract operation done at Harvard. She could have had it free in the United States, but because of the experience with some of the surgeons there, uh, we were able to, she had a great result, had it done there, we were there for a week, and then came home. So um, I can personally attest that I didn't want my wife to be upset with me that uh, uh, the quality was excellent. And the vision center, basically what Project hasn't said is they, the 20 or 30 rupees or 20 rupees, whatever it is, is based on the bus fare. What the bus would cost to go from the village to the main hospital. And the 20 or 30 rupees is for three months. So it's not a one-time fee, it's a three-month fee. I'm sorry to interrupt yeah, your Yeah, but I've still not answered uh, no, his no, question, no. which I will be doing in my next slide. So I talked about the benefit to the patient and the community for one disease, which we published uh, in Cornea. Now let me talk about uh, what is the cost to the hospital, and let us take uh, this hospital. We cluster these vision centers uh, closer to the tertiary hospitals. Uh, so this is a tertiary hospital at a place called Theni. Uh, this hospital was established in 1985 uh, with a service area uh, coverage of 1.2 million patients, and for this we have seven vision centers. So if you see this one in 2019, this whole thing, the vision centers actually contributed to 27% of the total cataracts being performed. So vision centers are 20 rupees for the outpatient facility. But when you are diagnosed with cataract, you are given a choice that either you can go to the free hospital here is the person who will meet you at the free hospital. There is also a choice if you want to go to the paying hospital, you can go to the paying hospital and you can go and meet this person and you pay the market price. So you have a, an, an awareness program created for them. And uh, so average per vision center, we are able to do 320 cataract surgeries and sell close to 1,370 spectacles. Again, the whole surplus goes to the hospital of uh, the spectacles as well as the cataract uh, surgeries. So we come to this specific question. So if you put a vision center, we are not taking the cost of the vision center. We cannot recover the cost of the vision center being put. The initial cost of the money uh, is philanthropic. But what we can really do is the maintaining the operational expenses. And uh, this was in 2019 for those seven vision centers. Uh, this was the income in rupees. This was the expense, just the income versus expense. Uh, it was cost neutral. But what we did was through these seven vision centers, we performed close to 2,300 surgeries. And we saved this much amount of money. Because if you had put a camp there, and if you had searched for it, then we would have, uh, have to spend so much amount of money. So we saved that amount of money. But what more interestingly was out of these 2,248 patients, 940 patients chose to go to the paying section. So that again brings in revenue to the hospital. And why don't they come on their own? Because one is the, the social determinants, they, they, are, they are scared, they don't know where to go. So we have an access. So this person acts as like a local guide for, for telling you that. So Mr. James will pick you up at the paying center. He'll be waiting for you. and so. The whole, the whole thing uh, transforms into a cost benefit for the patient. So we, we really don't make, uh, we can't recover the money which we have uh, incurred by putting on the vision center, but we make a little bit of a surplus on the operational uh, expenses of this vision center. But what is the key focus is the denominator part of it. What is the community needs? Because that vision center acts as a model for that community of 50,000 people. We are able to provide a complete care for those 50,000 people. Uh, basically, we are able to give a comprehensive and quality eye exam. We are able to close the loop. 
uh, and I'll show you what we mean by closing the loop. In a tertiary hospital, we are able to do only these two things. We can advise, diagnose, and we can treat. But in the vision uh, center, we are able to give the entire care pathway to the patient and also be there uh, when they come for their follow-up and also establish uh, the continuity of care. In that way, we are able to uh, uh, get a points over the quacker quacks who were there before us because the only advantage they had uh, with the community was their constant presence in the community. And we are able to do that uh, and we are able to uh, get them on our side. So for a population, what do we mean by defining the denominator? For a population of 50,000, if you estimate that 25% of the people derive, need some sort of an eye care, that means 12,500 people would require eye care. If you base a cataract surgical rate of 10,000, then it also means that you need to do 500 surgeries, 2,000 spectacles. If you just do this, you can take care of the vision needs of the community. That is what uh, our estimate is. And what we are able to do is we are able to cover 26.5%. We said 25% of unique population requires some sort of an eye care uh, position. And what, what we feel, what we say is, with vision centers, we are able to actually uh, look at 26.5% of the population. That means we theoretically cover everybody who need eye care in that population. When we are now multiplying it, uh, as I said, we have 100. The rate limiting step is not the money. The rate limiting step is the trained manpower who have been with us for six or seven years and who would be in that village, uh, who are willing to be in that village for a, for a long period of time. So this means that in our tertiary care model, even though we did 5 million outpatient visits uh, every year, we would have never reached everybody at the rural level. Only by putting vision centers, we are able to uh, give them uh, the power of accessibility. So they are also very good in, in, in catching up on these things, like, like the glaucoma part of it. In an eye camp, when you are seeing uh, 100 or 200 patients per day, it's very easy to miss out on things. But when you have an electronic medical record with doc proper documentation, your chance of uh, taking in, uh, uh, diagnosing a glaucoma and treating it correctly uh, is manifold. So what we have done is we have covered uh, a 7.8 million population using these vision centers. But more importantly, many uh, countries are now taking up this model. Uh, other states, these are states which have Aravind has no presence. The government of Tripura has put 40 vision centers. But more importantly, Bangladesh, our neighboring country, now has put 110 vision centers. We have 100 vision centers. They have 110 vision centers. They are very, very interested in this model. And uh, in fact, here is the prime minister. Our chairman actually is making a presentation to the uh, prime minister of Bangladesh. Vision, as you, as all of us know, is very important. Whether it's a child, the, for the child, it is important for the cognitive development of the, all the mental faculties. For the children, it is needed for their learning, for the adult to support their family and more so for the elderly people because they can lead an independent life. So uh, this vision center definitely support all the segment of the population, especially the elderly who may not be able to go to the cities to get the care. And I'm very sure long term, we'll be able to eliminate blindness from this region in a very sustainable way. So that is uh, a thing which we, we are now escalating it to the top uh, governmental thing and we are very, very happy that uh, the government of Bangladesh has taken up, taken this up and uh, doing it uh, for their population. So our main thing is we want to provide eye care. We feel that it's our responsibility to provide eye care to everybody in the community and not necessarily confine ourselves to people who access the hospital. So we are trying to close the loop and we are also able to give them a continuous access it is not possible, it is not cost effective to put an ophthalmologist at that part, nor would the ophthalmologist be willing to go and uh, stay in that part. But if a mid-level ophthalmic personnel worker who settled in that village acts as the person who acts as a conduit between the patient and the, and the hospital and is able to facilitate this exchange, what we say is this model is financially a sustainable model. 
Will VCs undermine the role of ophthalmologists? This is an area of concern for, for us, and we are very clear that we will go only where the ophthalmologists are not willing to go or, or don't have a, a plans to go. They are a very good uh, machinery that can help with case discovery, but ophthalmologists will, will focus on the treatment being provided as well as on the surgeries and specialties. But more importantly, it also helps in making tertiary care uh, more effective, especially in diseases like glaucoma and uh, diabetic retinopathy and macular eye conditions. We also believe that with this element of accessibility being offered to the patients, we would, can improve uh, the uh, cataract surgical rate from current, uh, if you really see or in an all India level, it's around 5,600, but we are very confident that we can push it to 10,000 and if you compare it is some uh, california has uh, 10000 so we we will we will come up to this level uh, using uh, this vision centers so that is my uh, my talk in fact i had a talk with brenton and uh, we 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 might explore a possibility in the future of trying to set up a similar facility or similar roid facility uh, in the us uh, to to see whether we can really look at the disadvantaged population. The only message I want to leave out from this is vision centers, when, as I said, we, we, we are now doing 2,500 teleconsultations every day. So it's ultimately, we also feel that all of this will go out from our hands. It's all going to go to the phone. They are going to self-treat uh, themselves. But till then, if you really want to hold that audience, this is the way to go. So, any any questions, sir? Yeah. Real quick, I'm sorry, I got here a little late. I don't know if you mentioned this. It looks like you had 173,000 cataract surgeries. What percentage of those was the nucleus with the lens so dense that you could not fake it that ended up like a micro extra capsule extraction with a few sutures? What percentage? So, in our paying section, means people who are affluent who come to us, 80% is topical phacoemulsification. 80% is topical phacoemulsification, foldable lenses, and uh, just the same thing. Out of that, maybe 15% will go for multifocals. But in the patients of this population, 75% would, would require uh, uh, an MSICS, a small incision cataract surgery, which, which anyway is our main uh, way of uh, this thing. We are very comfortable doing uh, the SICS procedure. Yes. 75% will not be fakeable. Will not be fakeable at all. Okay, very good. Yeah. We, 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 we do under the premise, uh, we are not comparing FACO with SICS here. We are doing with SICS versus no surgery because these people are any, otherwise are not going to get any surgery. And what we saw was in COVID, when we couldn't offer the services just for one and a half years, the amount of people with mature cataract went up very, very high. Uh, people who had some money had somehow access to a hospital and came. But people who had no money, uh, really, uh, we, we went uh, once again to the bilateral mature cataract. We were, we were thinking that we were never going to see bilateral mature cataract anymore. but. We saw it for that uh, first period of time, yeah. Sounds a little bit like my practice in rural Pennsylvania. That's why I asked. Oh, it's sir. safer. Yes. yes. Yes, sir. How does your system compare to, say, LB Prasad's? So both of them follow a same model uh, in a, in a uh, broader scheme of things. Uh, both are non-governmental organizations. Both are doing uh, community outreach activities. But volume-wise, we are like... Uh, we must be at least five times bigger. We, 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 uh, this thing, but more importantly, on the financial sustainable model, 99% of Aravind's money is internally generated from patient care. It is patient's money. We are very, very poor in getting donations. Uh, our model is very sustainable, and that is why we are a case study in Harvard Business School. Uh, not in Harvard Medical School, but in Harvard Business School, as well as in Ross School. Uh, because of the sustainable model. Because you can still do 40% free, 60%, I mean, 40% paying, 60% free, but when you're talking of a total population of 600,000 surgeries, 40% of 600,000 surgeries is very high. So that is the, the, the scale of the thought. The other part is 
different. We are the only organization which uh, also is in the manufacturing business. We make intraocular lenses. Uh, I'll give you a statistic. 12% of the global intraocular lenses is being uh, uh, supplied by our hospital, 12% of the global intraocular lenses. Uh, especially in Africa, Southeast Asia, Latin America, uh, we have a huge model. But we are the largest users of Alcon's lenses in the whole of Southeast Asia. So again, I'm giving you contradictions. The patient is given a menu card. The patient chooses as to what they want uh, thing. Because we, want, we don't want to be saying that you should use only Aurolab lenses because they are cheaper. Because our competitors may just come and say, oh, these are low, co low quality uh, providers. So we need to give a choice to the patient. The whole aspect of this presentation is you give a sort of a, a, a pride to the patient. The patient pays the 20 rupees, and then he becomes a paying customer. He feels nice about the whole scheme of things. But then he lures, he, he's being lured into the correct scheme of things rather than going to a quack and uh, not getting these things. But we have mutual respect for both the organizations. And uh, we learn from each other. And we have uh, a good, healthy respect for each other. Yeah. So I go for my final presentation. So um, I guess we're running behind. If anybody needs a, a quick break, feel free to go. But if you'd like to dive straight into the next yeah. presentation. Yeah, it's just a short presentation, and it'll feel, okay. yeah. Okay. It's going to. So this is going to be my final presentation. As I told you, for the past 20 years, I've been the residency program director. And I've also uh, been the uh, coordinator for international training uh, of ophthalmologists. But for today's uh, thing, it's going to be a lighter presentation. And I'm going to talk exclusively from one program in which I was uh, very closely associated with, the Queen Elizabeth Diamond Jubilee Trust program. So before we go in, what is the workforce of Aravid? We saw the volume. So we, we have close to around 5,000 employees with 273 attendings, 163 postgraduates, and 208 fellows. What it means is we have to have a lot of training to be done for our staff just like this. But we still take it as our mandate to go and train uh, other people who would require this training. We estimate that 15% of India's ophthalmologists have undergone some training at Aravind. But what is more surprising is we have trained surgical, uh, surgically 20% of Nigerian ophthalmologists at Aravind. So it is not confined only to Indian ophthalmologists, but it is also around 25% 25, 25 of Nigerian ophthalmologists, which is the largest uh, country in Africa, uh, are trained at Aravind. You might be interested to know, uh, Brenton alluded to it, we also estimate that 800 of the American ophthalmologists have undergone some sort of surgical training at Aravind uh, over this past 35 years. Uh, we have seen people who have come here as third year resident have now become uh, 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 university professors. In fact, the current CEO of American Academy of Ophthalmology and the editor of ophthalmology, Dr. Stephen McLeod, was once a, uh, a third year trainee at Aravind. So we, we have had uh, this connection so far. So we also train a lot of fellows. So far, we have trained close to around 1,500 fellows, that is in house. And uh, short term, we have trained close to around 2,770 ophthalmologists. So not only is our patient volume big, our training volume is also big. And paramedical, we have trained close to around 1,351 people. So why, why am I talking about this is this is in our ethos. This is in our mandate to train as many people as possible in all aspects of ophthalmology. And when this program came, uh, we, we readily jumped into it uh, uh, with a lot of enthusiasm. Queen Elizabeth 
cele uh, celebrated her uh, diamond jubilee of ascension to the throne, that is to celebrate her 60th year of ascension to the throne, by trying to do some philanthropy. I don't think she had any idea, uh, but her council of advisors told that ophthalmology would, would, would serve the cause better. We didn't have any role to play at that point of time. I would, I would have loved to say that we sort of influenced uh, Queen Elizabeth to do it. But luckily, uh, John Major, the ex-Prime Minister of uh, UK, uh, was the person who wanted to uh, actually, given the mandate of spending this money uh, uh, to celebrate uh, Queen Elizabeth's ascension to the throne. So the total budget was around £7 million, pounds, uh, which was her personal money, which was also uh, matched by another £3 million pounds of UK taxpayers' money. So it was a large grant with a very ambitious uh, uh, plan to train a lot of people from the Commonwealth. So we had a lot of training program uh, initiatives. Uh, I, I was involved in this project for almost five to six years. Uh, this was... Uh, Sir John Major, who was the person uh, who was the chairperson of this whole uh, training program. And uh, I had the uh, experience of going to the Parliament House of UK as well as the Buckingham Palace. So we formed a common eye, Commonwealth Eye Health Consortium. The idea was to train as many eye care professionals of the Commonwealth uh, in the Commonwealth countries. So we had 48 Commonwealth countries uh, which were involved. And we were very clear that the Indian ophthalmologists will not be trained at the Indian centers. They would go to other countries in the Commonwealth, while the other countries of the Commonwealth would serve, would send their uh, doctors involved. So we wanted to do this kind of a uh, thing. So a huge number of supranational organizations uh, and other uh, institutions were involved in this project with a we had a steering committee meetings that, uh, comprised, uh, you were asking about uh, LV Prasad here, is Dr. Rao here. He was also uh, uh, a part of the, uh, the consortium steering committee. Uh, and uh, you had people from Africa, from uh, Western part of Africa, East Africa, South Africa, uh, as well as uh, uh, from UK. So this was launched, uh, and uh, Aravind was very uh, uh, proud to play a major part in this. And we launched it in Durban in October 2016 uh, in this COEXA meeting. And uh, we trained people from all over, as I said, and a total of around 140 uh, eye care professionals were trained in this five-year period. So what I'm going to talk to you today in the next 15 to 20 minutes is the experiences of how difficult or how easy it is from a provider's point of view to train a large number of people like this. You know, it's, we always hear it from uh, the trainee's point of view, but I'm going to share some of the problems which we encountered uh, from the uh, trainer's point of view. Uh, as you can see, amongst the host institutions, uh, Aravind was, uh, had trained around 40 of those people, but then Throughout the world, there were other centers, including Moorfields, who were part of the uh, a training uh, curriculum. So the number of uh, ophthalmologists we trained in this three-year period was around 28 people. All of them stayed for a minimum period of one year at Aravind uh, from all these countries. As you can see, uh, Nigerian ophthalmologists are more, because that is also because Nigeria is the largest uh, country in Africa. But apart from the long-term fellowship training, we also had uh, uh, 28 people who came in for a short-term observership uh, program in this whole scheme of things. So this training was not only for doctors. Uh, it was all retinoblastoma. It was like a personalized training on just the counseling for retinoblastoma was like a one-month training course. It was a very structured and a personalized training course for, uh, for uh, fluorescent angiography, microbiology techniques, and other things. Now I come to the problems. So this was an email which we received from one of our African trainees suddenly. So when you are in a busy training uh, surgical course, 
uh, you get suddenly an email from, from this because this was a large influx of training people and you needed you 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 didn't anticipate that problems will come from these kind of things this was such an emotional request you couldn't ignore so you had to go and pacify and then talk with them and then immediately responding so then you have to have arrange a meeting with the catering department and then uh, try and talk with them and uh, see how best we can keep there because they are going to stay for one whole year and uh, we need to have all these kind of issues I intentionally I'm talking about all these practical issues uh, associated with, with training because there is a third party involved and if the same thing goes to the queen I'm going to be in trouble so we, we, we need to take care of all these things so we, we have a certain bonhomie with them uh, uh, one big advantage of these exchange program is things go beyond just ophthalmology it's about sharing of cultures it's about uh, talking with them understanding their needs and perspectives and also making things easier for them so you we just train only 28 ophthalmologists and i'll just talk to you about the serious problems we encountered during uh, our training uh, these people so one pay, one doctor from kenya he was playing badminton with our doctors uh, at uh, the hospital after work, he just collapsed. And uh, when he collapsed, we, we were, I mean, we as eye doctors, you at least have an advantage, at least you have uh, a, clo a closeness to your physicians and other things, but we just don't understand, you know, we, 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 we know only the eye. And we rushed him to the recent, uh, the, the medical center hospital, we did an MRI, and the patient was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis for the first time. He, he never had any episode or anything. And we, was, we were also very, uh, very, very uh, scared, actually, because the relatives are not here. Uh, the patient, uh, the person, I mean, insurance is not a big thing because we, we had a huge consortium supporting it. But a person collapsing is, is very difficult to handle uh, and how to do this. But over a period of time, we were actually posting our doctors on vigil treatment for him. Instead of posting our doctors on uh, our rotations, we, we posted uh, one of our postgraduates on rotation to be with him till he was completely normal. And the bonding really developed between that doctor and the candidate. And he still didn't want to go home. We said, you know, we encouraged him very subtly, uh, slightly to say, okay, now we have made you reasonably okay, now is the time for you to go home. He said, no, 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 I want to learn something and be useful to my country. Fortunately for us and fortunately for him, he continued his uh, 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 training with us. A very scary moment for, for us is Dr. Bett, and uh, he's from Kenya. He's a very successful, uh, successful corneal uh, transplant surgeon now, but he gave us very anxious moments uh, for around uh, two weeks of his training here. So anything can develop when, you, when you're handling such kind of uh, activities. And then there was another person who, who developed dengue, and uh, you, he, he developed severe fever, and then he was again admitted in the hospital. Court trainees uh, were with him. And then again, he said, he, he, after recovering, he went home, and then he said, I look forward to visiting uh, Madurai one day, at least no matter the experience I got on dengue. So you, you have 28 people, so I don't know what uh, is this thing. So many things can happen, can go wrong uh, when you are doing all these kind of programs. So when the doctors are here, we have to invest a lot of time in their training. Uh, they get a license to practice from the Medical Council of India, and uh, they spend a year with them. And the trainees also feel uh, they, are, they, they, they have been asked by their government to go or they have been asked by their organization to go and so sometimes they feel very entitled to get a lot of cases during the training and uh, the people who are already with us also feel betrayed you know somebody else is coming and doing a lot more surgeries than i am where i am here working with you for two or three years so it's a very very a difficult challenge for us as providers to sort of uh, keep these things going but we don't confine ourselves just to surgical training uh, we, we have um, short-term training in microbiology, which is very, very important, especially in countries like Africa, where they have fungal and bacterial keratitis. And also in retina diagnostic procedures, we have curriculum for this. 
and we are able to train them in good photographs and other things. If you really see in ophthalmology cover pictures, uh, in the Journal of Ophthalmology, especially for the past four years, at least 10% uh, ophthalmology medicine, ophthalmology retina, ophthalmology glaucoma, at least 10% of the cover issues are from Aravin because we have excellent photographic uh, techniques and we have very good uh, clinical uh, patients. We are able to uh, provide this amount of training and care. So we also encourage them. They come as trainees, but we, we give them chances. We, we sort of train them to become teachers. We allow them to present their cases in grand rounds. So they are not trainees uh, by trainees themselves. We sort of uh, give them opportunities to, to go this thing. Dr. Vasco, his name was Dr. Vasco da Gama, a very uh, interesting uh, name. And uh, he, he was a very interesting personality. He came as, he was from Mozambique. He came for a pediatric ophthalmology training. And when we were training him, he, he became, he, he took the Indian culture very, very uh, quickly enough. And he went into camps and other things. And what we decided was we asked him, what is your problem? You know, he said, we, we can be well trained, but I don't have a team which can, which can help me, which can assist me. So what we did was we brought in, we wrote to the Queen Elizabeth Diamond Jubilee Trust Getting a visa in Mozambique to India was not a problem. So we shot six months into the program, we brought in all these four people, a pediatric nurse, a pediatric counselor, and a pediatric orthoptist. This was not part of our original uh, plan, but we brought all of them here. They also underwent training with, for three months so that they can go and assist uh, Vasco when he goes back. So when we asked Vasco if that is enough, uh, he said, why don't you allow the nurses to uh, assist me in the theater at Madurai? We didn't have a license for these nurses, but we went ahead and uh, we, we just allowed them to, to, to assist them. And what we also did after that was we sort of looked at Vasco. Can I open this, please? Uh, should I? Yeah, that, 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 the project proposal. Was that file on your computer? No, oh, I, I, I want this. OK, anyway, that, that's not a problem. That's not a big problem. We helped him develop a proposal uh, which we forwarded to the Mozambique Health Ministry. You know, it was beyond us. We were just training one doctor here. But we ended up bringing his counselor, bringing in his orthoptist, helping him write a proposal to the health ministry, and brought in people from the health ministry of Mozambique while he was here to, to sort of convince them to sort of, uh, uh, hello, Dr. Rapuano. Hi. How are you? Fine. <laughs> Konya, Konya bonding. <laughs> so, uh, we, we had uh, the whole team, the health ministry from Mozambique, which came in. And so we were able to actually put a pediatric ophthalmology system in Mozambique instead of just training a pediatric ophthalmologist. So that was very interesting for us. And uh, we, as I said, we were able to tell them the need for uh, setting up a hospital there. How do you calculate the need? How do you provide the need? And how do you uh, sort of sustain the need? I think I'm, I'm not able to. Let me try this. This is a very interesting grant access. Hold on one second. One okay. Second. One second. Yes. Yeah, that's the file. Can can we make it bigger, please? <clears throat> One, 
Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. This, this is fine. Yeah. So there, there's always a challenge to to manage the expectation of the of the trainees when they come, and then the trainers who are there. As you can see, the first part, the progress is the report which is given by the trainer, and then the second thing is. Uh, the, the, the mail which is down below is the complaint written by the trainee to us. So as you can see, the point number one, I never received an assessment from, the, from my trainer. But the trainer feels that you know, the trainee should be so grateful that I'm able to help them uh, with, with giving them so many chances. So when you are the person who have to manage both, uh, that, that becomes a, a challenge by itself. And then there was another person who wanted and this is the final thing which I wrote to my doctor. Please sit with her and see what it can be done in the last one month. Because the whole problem was surfaced in the last uh, two months of their training program. Uh, but, but I'm just bringing it to just to say that uh, uh, the whole thing. And, and becomes bad, actually. This is from the trainer. She says, regarding the first point, that we have not given feedback on our squint assessment is wrong. She used to bring the case and discuss the following with one of the things. Oh, this, 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 this. So you you need to be you need to be very 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 uh, diplomatic uh, in handling uh, all these things. Can I go back to my slides, please? And uh, this is another person who writes to me saying that okay, I'm very happy to come for a three month training. But I want the training in laser capsulotomy, membranotomy, LASIK, PRK, eye banking, and training in contact lens. I consider these missing aspects very important for a cornea specialist in my hospital. And he wants this training given in uh, this thing. And he says it is available in my website. And I searched for my website, which says where in the part where do I, do I have a program which can uh, offer him so much. And I send back to him saying, I don't see such kind of uh, thing in the website. And he says, and uh, the information I sent were from a link I had downloaded much earlier. There was ne never a link like that which can offer this kind of a training in three to four months. So you, you always see it from one side, that you are, you're all seeing from the trainee's perspective. It is very difficult from the trainer's perspective as well. That's the point I'm trying to uh, bring across. And there has to be a balance. Uh, between what that expectation is and what can be offered without antagonizing the trainees. Already you have 1,000 trainees inside the hospital. You don't want to get uh, antagonized on them. So we, we also take them. Our eye banking is a complete eye banking. When we say eye banking, we can't uh, call and ask for our eye banks. We go to the a house where the deceased is there, or we go to the hospital, we enucleate it, and then we bring it to our eye bank and we process it. And we have our own uh, uh, storage medium. Uh, and we hope that one day you are going to use that storage medium because you don't have a choice, because Optisol is closing. And uh, we, we, we have an opportunity to provide the world with Cordisol, which we, 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 we are actually making. And uh, so we take our African colleagues to the morgue to see how we do the eye recovery, uh, take them on uh, rallies to, to help them understand how they can do all these things, not confine themselves just to the OR and to the uh, clinic itself, allow them to give a grand rounds lecture, participate in the telemedicine activities, also involve them in management activities like financial sustainability, like how do you ensure quality and all these other stuff to sort of take them to a different level when they go and establish uh, their own prog programs themselves. So we also encourage them to participate in the local conferences where we allow them to help them write a paper, uh, allow them to also train them to uh, present a conference. And also, this is Dr. Muna, is a very uh, ambitious person at KCMC Tanzania, uh, and he's able to do corneal transplants independently now. So culturally, we celebrate their birthdays. Uh, and this was a very interesting thing. Dr. Muna invited all the cornea. This is my cornea faculty and my cornea uh, fellow group. He said, I want to present Apple for everybody. So our team was very excited. He said, how in the world is going to uh, present? You know, we, we just thought Apple was Apple, you know, not the Apple. And he, he presented an Apple to us. 
And he said, this is the highest respect that one can give uh, in Tanzania, that giving an apple uh, was considered as a mark of respect. So it was a, it was a lot of understanding for us as well, uh, uh, this thing. And so Dr. Muna had his day on that day. So we, we take them out for dinners. We take we, we sort of socially engage them with the, with the small kids of our uh, faculty so that they get to understand the cultural part of the uh, of the whole scheme of things. Uh, see here, uh, we have another doctor actually trained in uh, uh, wearing a dhoti, wearing an Indian costume. I'm, we are all wearing Western costumes, and he comes uh, wearing an Indian costume, and then celebrating Holi. Uh, throwing colors uh, and uh, making him, and he he went on his own to uh, to a fortune teller to to uh, find out about his future. I'm sure he would have asked him how many surgeries I would have I would get in the next one month. That that would be uh, the discussion. So after that, we we do a formal fellowship completion report where they present a report. I'm not going to open it and show it, and then we present them with a certificate. But imagine that we had to do this 42 people training in a short span of time without uh, changing too much of uh, things which are already happening in our training centers. What we then did was we wanted to find out how they were faring after they went for a training. And we, went, we sent mentors there to the field after training them. We sent our mentors there. Our mentors went there. You can see one of our mentors there with their team. And uh, when he went to Nigeria, he's, he, he gave us one report which was very disappointing. He said four mentees have collectively done one squint surgery after spending this one whole year at Aravin. This is the problem which we, we, we need to address. You can train everybody. You can train as much as you want. But unless you really have a place where they can actually continue their training, it's going to be a waste. The latest model of expensive Zeiss Lemera microscope bought eight months back, not used because of fogging issues in that. They have everything, but they don't have the final uh, this thing. So this is disappointing. Uh, this was disappointing. But then, again, another mentor goes and says, there was an outdated vitrectomy machine there. But we all saw YouTube. We made connections in two hours, and we used one probe uh, for two cases. So they. At least our people were trying to help as much as possible. But the sad fact is, when they go back to their place, there's not much of support system available for them to practice uh, the skills which have learned here. But then there have been other good examples as well. This is from a doctor from Ghana. Uh, when we asked them, what have you done? She says, the greatest impact on my practice has been my ability to perform surgeries I have not done before. Prior to my Aravind experience, procedures seemed very difficult and completely out of my league. However, with the training I acquired, I have been confident to expand my surgical skills. So she says, I operate a longer list than before and increasing my speed and also turnover rate. So you have, you have good experience as well. So Dr. Rosemary tells that in terms of surgical skills, I'm very comfortable with ptosis surgeries, lacrimal surgeries. And she says, returning home after the training, I was initially scared of how I would begin. But like how trainer told us to start with simple cases and gradually build up. More happy for us is, she says, now I train residents on proper diagnosis and management of orbital disease. This is what we want. We want the local faculty to take up responsibility to train their own doctors in the future, because not everybody can afford to come and stay for one whole year. Uh, but then. He says, we are doing corneal transplant. For example, last year, we did around 27 PKP. This is a big thing, because the figure seems to be small. But in Africa, this is a big number for penetrating keratoplasty. So and also, he, they are doing regular collagen cross-linking. So there have been very good uh, reports of these people getting trained also. And here, I operate all children with cataracts, squint, and other conditions, with exception of glaucoma for surgery. And what the training obtained at Aravind keeps me going till today. I've operated more than 50 children with bilateral cataract in 2021. So that was very, very uh, fulfilling for us. So that the main thing is, important thing in both my presentation is measuring quality, measuring the impacts. As, and as long as we don't, uh, we think that just offering training alone will settle the issue. It is not going to settle the issue. We have to measure, we have to fine tune, and we have to refine. 
So that is very, very important in the whole scheme of things. This is a nice picture which was sent uh, by our training of, a, of operating on a bilateral mature cataract, uh, who is Dr. Everista. She says, thank you, sir, for giving us this opportunity to train them. And this is the grateful patient. Uh, such kind of photographs help us uh, continue with our mission of training, where we have made an impact, where we go beyond just training them in just the surgical part. How do we assist them to have a good ecosystem to, to help them nurture uh, their skills? So this is also important because this doctor from Nepal says, we now become more concerned. Uh, what he means is we are now uh, more open to give better care to our patients at lower costs. So he's not able to, uh, he's able to understand the importance of doing it in a cost effective manner also. So this doctor from Nigeria, he says he, he has ranked it six out of 10. And, but then sometimes it is depressing. But he says, myself and another Aravind fellow, trained fellow, are able to attend to infants with congenital glaucoma surgically. We have done about four successfully trabeclectomy, congenital trabeclectomy. I, I thought it should be given 10 out of 10 if he's able to independently uh, do uh, this thing. So I'm giving you both the faces of, uh, of the trainer and the trainee. So, it also helped me uh, get other experiences. Uh, in fact, uh, the queen was personally interested in, in, in it by, uh, this is her daughter-in-law, uh, Princess Sophie. Uh, she threw a party for us at St. James Palace at 2018. Uh, at that point of time only, I understood that the Buckingham Palace was not the original palace of the queen. Uh, that was fr uh, bought from the Duke of Buckingham. St. James Palace was the original palace of the, of the royalty, where we were uh, thrown a reception. And then a surprise, I, I got an invitation as part of an 18 member group uh, to attend a reception at the Buckingham Palace. Uh, it threw a big fit because that was the third time I was going to UK. And uh, at the immigration, they were asking me as to why I was coming to the UK again and again. I said, you want to see? And I showed him this invitation. He was so excited. And he called all the other guys from the immigration and they said, he's going to the palace. And uh, it was it was a it was a it was a great honor. Uh, this is the Buckingham Palace, uh, where we were uh, asked to come to a reception, and we were presented uh, to the Queen, where uh, she was personally interested. I was very very impressed by a 93 year old person, maybe well tutored the day before, but then tutored on a 93 year old person. But she knew exactly whom she was talking to, because this person who's reading it tells you who you are. But then she, she doesn't know the details, but she knows about India. And then she's able to make it some generic, uh, uh, this thing. And she spent almost 45 minutes with us. It was not just a ritual uh, just like that. Uh, uh, you know, I might have all the degrees uh, in this thing, but in my patient room, if I have this, it opens up a lot of uh, things. <laughs> you know, they might assume that I'm the I'm her uh, Majesty's uh, ophthalmologist. I, I can't help it. I can't help it if they if they assume it that way. But it helps uh, to to have this kind of uh, uh, a relationship. So, what are the benefits? It aligns perfectly with the mission of the institution. You you get upset by the stomach upsets, by the dengue, by the multiple sclerosis, by not giving training and things. But see the larger scheme of things. The largest scheme of thing is I'm not going to go and operate on those eight congenital blind people in, uh, in Tanzania or Nigeria. So the only way is to multiply your hands and allow those people to do things on their own and be a role model for their young surgeons to follow. <coughs> Chance to forge lifelong professional relationship, definitely yes. Opportunity to collaborate on research projects of common interest, but more importantly, invaluable cross-cultural experiences. I was telling uh, Brent, I've got a fantastic experience from Philadelphia. Yesterday, I should thank every one of you for this. I went on a, uh, on a, on a walking tour. Uh, it was very funny because I was the only person uh, because I think it was hot for others. It was perfectly, uh, <laughs> uh, I was very, very comfortable. And we made a very good pair because I was a foreigner. And he was fully dressed up in that army outfit. And we both were marching along the streets of uh, Philadelphia, where we got a fantastic tour uh, uh, and learned so much about your great country. And uh, more importantly, 
I would like to acknowledge these people for this specific study. But here I want to put on record how much Aravind has learned and gained from its professional relationship with the doctors from the US. We've been very thankful uh, for all the help we, we have received from the, from the mentors from the US. Uh, their relationship is almost like 45 to 50 years old now. Uh, and we really hope uh, that this visit of mine would open up a new era in Aravind Will's uh, relationship. The largest eye centers in both the countries have to forge a relationship which is mutually beneficial. Uh, I understand that we need to take small steps, uh, but I think if we take small and concrete steps with both our uh, expertise, uh, we would be able to make something meaningful. We, we still uh, require a lot of learning from you, and we would once again request you to continue the support uh, which you've been giving and offering uh, to our institution, to our country. And we thank uh, each one of you. Uh, and we also hope that you will serve as ambassadors for, for the mission, not for the uh, institution, but for the mission to eradicate needless blindness. Thank you very much for all your patience. <laughs> That's, that's it seems a, to be better. That's a nice question. We, we don't mix procedures usually. We, we do, uh, uh, it, it's not like uh, that we have to do it this way. I'll just share what we are doing this way. All SICS, we just put rigid lens. Yeah. But it's not like you, shouldn't, you should do this. This is what we do as a practice. Yes. Thank you so much for that lecture. Um, I have a question about follow-up care. Um, the patients who travel to get their surgery surgery care, um, do, are, is there follow-up care in, the, in like the clinic that's closer to them? Yes, so the patients who go to vision centers uh, are, are actually, you know, referred from the vision centers, take their follow-up care at the vision center itself. And that is the advantage of a vision center because there is a permanent facility where they can go to. And uh, so that is where they get follow-up care. Uh, for patients who have already come on their own, that without camps, they have to come for a day one. Uh, usually 80% of daycare, they come for a day one uh, uh, training the next day. Uh, but for camp patients who have not come from vision center but who were bused down, we, we do a follow-up in the camp site at around a month after the follow-up. Uh, but that's still an imperfect model. We really feel the vision center is a model which provides continuous care. Yeah. Yes, sir. Another quick question. With respect to penetrating keratoplasty, close your ears. <laughs> Trained here many years ago, when I went into practice, we would have patients on a list, and patients would put into the hospital, die in the morgue, would do harvest the eye, do the enucleation, take it to the slit lamp, look at it, and then take it to the operating, right to the operating room, and use that as the donor of tissue. Did you ever do that with any of the cases there? We, we don't need to do it because we have a uh, fully established protocol. Uh, we have a specular microscope. We have to have a serology done. We, we, we have to have a hepatitis B and uh, HIV and everything. So we, we have standard practice guidelines. And as I said, we also manufacture our own storage media. Uh, so we don't need to do anything in a hurry. And we have plenty of harvesting tissue. In fact, I was sharing uh, that at Aravind, we harvest close to 4,000 ice every year. Uh, it's a huge uh, number, and we, we do close to around 2,000 keratoplasties each year across all our events put together. And uh, we also share, uh, we, we, uh, legally we cannot uh, uh, send the tissue out of the country, but we can share it to our colleagues uh, in other parts of India. Uh, but we, we do it in a, we, we don't immediately uh, do that kind of a transplantation. That said, when I started my training, we used to do that uh, because we, we wanted to conserve. Even MK medium was so scarce. And MK medium also had to be saved. 
and anything, any way we are going to transplant it, let us transplant it. But that was in, an, uh, in, a, in a benign time where we didn't even, uh, were worried about HIV or uh, hepatitis B or any other thing. You had the hospital records, you saw the lab tests that were, and it was before you got treatment. Yes. A question for you about the fellowships. So one of the things that I think Ervin has been um, extremely influential in low resource healthcare settings outside of India is bringing um, trained ophthalmologists and allowing them to do some specialty fellowships. Are those uh, individuals, uh, particularly from uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, are they supported by external uh, funding when they come for their fellowships, or does Aravin support them in any particular way? That's a nice question. So we, we sort of encourage, you know, having encountered all this problems of doctors not able to do when they are a, when they are going back to their this thing we confine ourselves to training uh, trainees from institutions uh, so there has to be some university or or some people who take up the responsibility of providing infrastructure to the trainees when they come back having established such kind of requests it's very easy for an african ophthalmologist to obtain funding uh, because money is there Money is there for uh, sending them for training and then uh, getting trained and sending them back. Money is not a problem. So the problem is how do you create an enabling environment for them when they go back? So Aravind will not be able to uh, give everything for free. It charges a fee, but the fee is so tiny. It's more like a token uh, fee. I was charged like $1 to go into the uh, Independence Day Hall yesterday. It was it was a token payment where you had to pay, you know, some sort of a, a this thing. So something like that. So the 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 cost mainly incurred for by that doctor is the opportunity cost, which he would have got the salary if he had been in Africa. So you you need to create that. You need to factor in that part. But we don't pay any stipend or we don't have any uh, grant to uh, do this. Having said that. For institutions with whom we derive a benefit from, like Hopkins, Mass India, UCLA, all those residents come in for free. They don't, they don't pay for their uh, stay or they don't pay for their uh, surgical training or anything. Because these institutions have been so generous in training Aravind ophthalmologists. Uh, and it's more like a, not a training relationship, it's more of a reciprocal respective uh, relationship between uh, institutions. So, yeah. And the, for the, um, the physicians when they are returning after their one-year fellowship or, or however long, you shared some stories that they had from feedback in terms of the challenges that they encountered in terms of either just getting patients to come for surgery or the uh, equipment that they had available. Do, is there any portion of the fellowship that is um, included in discussions with LICO or any sort of uh, supervision or training by LICO so that they have a relationship when they go back to their home country um, and they have some sort of resource then to reach out to? Yes, yes, and uh, there have been encouraging stories and disappointing stories, and that is a fact of life. Uh, people who have worked in Africa would understand that it's much more uh, uh, respectful for an ophthalmologist to turn into public health specialist when they go back. So what happens is you make a hero out of a person for five years and training him, giving him all the infrastructure. You see him in all the meetings. You, you would see you go for American Academy, the same guy would come and think. But then after five years, he becomes the, uh, the sort of a health secretary for Tanzania. What it means is he just doesn't do any more surgery uh, and anything. That has been a big challenge uh, for us. But we do sort of work with them. Uh, but to tell it very shortly, it's a very, it's a very big challenge, especially tackling bureaucracy in many parts of Africa. But the trainees are very good. They want to do something different. The train, they are also the system also wants to help them. But then they have other issues. You know, they have uh, ma their main budget goes towards maternal and child care. Uh, immunization and all that kind of stuff. Blindness comes uh, the last of the priority, yes. And you also see uh, may, many organizations which used to play a major role, like <coughs> CBM, a, a Christopher Blinder Mission in Africa, have cut down on their funding and other parts, so things are challenging. 
But we are actually pushing for a self-sustaining model everywhere, wherever uh, we, we want to play a role. Because that's the only model which will, which will, where you can make a difference over a period of time. Yes, sir. Can you talk specifically about the imaging technology that you have at the vision centers that enables the telemedicine visits? Um, and second, can you talk about your retention rates for all the ophthalmic trainees um, and technicians that you have at those vision centers? At the vision center? Uh, just the retention rate for... At the vision center, you mean? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a good question. The answer to your second question is the retention of the vision center is 100%. The retention of the main center maybe is 15 to 20%. And I'll tell you why. I told you we follow a life cycle, not the life cycle of an ophthalmological system, the life cycle of a, of a human being. Usually they join us when uh, the girl is 18, and usually they get married by 23 or 24. And so they all go out. And that is why you have 85% attrition rate at that point of time. I told you in the vision center, there are people, these are people who have already worked at Arabin for five to seven years, who are married and who are settled. And probably their husband is in that village or nearby that village where uh, they, are, they are this thing. So it is a, it, it is a win-win situation for them. And they are 27, 28. By the time they come back and join the vision center, they already have their kids. Uh, kids are sort of grown up. And when it's in a rural environment, the grandparents are able to take care of the kids. And so it's like she's the boss of that center with none of us bossing around her. So so many factors play a role in, uh, in the retaining process. Could you also comment on what sort of technological infrastructure you have at the Vision Center as far as, it sounds like you have fundus cameras, maybe slit lamp photography, but do you also have OCTs, fluorescein angiograms? No, no. We don't have OCTs, we don't have fluorescein angiograms, no. The, the only instruments we have is the, is the refracting cubicles uh, with a self-lighting uh, setup. We have an applination tonometry with slit lamp, and we also have a fundus camera. That's it. No other technology. All the other things the patient have to come to the hospital.